Well, hello, and welcome to another lesson with Dr. H. Um, this one's going to be over cardiophysiology, and this is basically an introduction to cardiophysiology. So in order to prepare you for about what's ready to unfold, I want you guys to try to think about what is cardiophysiology? What does that even mean? And I think in order to do that, you need to always remember that in anatomy and physiology, that anatomy is structure, physiology is function, and that structure determines function. So when we're going about thinking about what the function of the heart is, you should never lose perspective that the anatomy, that the structures help drive that function. <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, let's think about what the actual function of the heart is, right? It's a pump and it's pumping blood throughout the body. It's going to be pumping blood both to the lungs where that blood gets oxygenated and is going to be pumping blood to the rest of the body, the systemic circuit. And that's oxygenated blood that now goes out to the tissues and provides that tissue with the oxygen. So ultimately, when we want to try to think about the heart, a nice easy way to think about cardiophysiology is that it pumps blood, right? Heart well, let's summarize that. Pumps blood. All right, great. What does that mean? What are we even looking at when we're looking at the, the heart as a pump and the fact that it pumps blood? Well, ultimately, what we want to be able to think about is what anatomy of the heart defines this function? That it can pump blood and when that all comes down to it i think it's really kind of a simplified process to try to think about that this is going to require muscle so the heart is just a big old muscle and it's made up of what's called cardio myo sites easy peasy lemon squeezy right we're done that's it no, that's, that's, that's not it. We're not done. Cardio tells you heart. Myo tells you muscle. Sites tells you cells. But there's actually two different types of cardiomyocytes in the heart. The smallest population of cardiomyocytes doesn't really contract and relax. They're less than 1% of the total population of the heart. And they're called autorhythmic cells. Auto means self, rhythmic, rhythm. These are autorhythmic cells. They are going to create their own rhythm. And I'm going to put that into perspective in just a second. <clears throat> the other types of cells are the actual contractile cells. So we're going to go ahead and name them cardiac myocytes in essence. Or we can actually name them myocardial cells. which tells you that they are the muscle cells of the heart. All right, cool. What does that all mean? What, what, what does this mean? What does this anatomy actually mean towards this function of pumping blood? <clears throat> well, really what it comes down to is the fact that the heart is a very unique organ. You can actually take the heart out of the chest cavity. Please don't do this, disclaimer. And it will still beat. Huh, that's pretty darn interesting. As long as it has all the proper uh, nutrients and oxygen and everything, it can continue to beat. And that's because the heart has an autorhythmic property. Auto meaning self, rhythm meaning it creates its own rhythm. Let's think about how this is even possible. In order to do that, think back on what you guys learned about skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles contract and relax. But how do they do that? What do they require? And the answer is, is they require an action potential, right? They require electricity stimulating those muscles. So electricity is going to travel from the brain where it originated, travels all the way down the axon before it activates a terminal bouton, does what it does, creates another action potential on that skeletal muscle that drives contraction and relaxation. <clears throat> So how does that differ in cardiac muscle? 
Here's how it differs. Skeletal muscle required an action potential from the brain, but the heart creates its own action potential. And where do you think that occurs? That occurs right here in the autorhythmic cell. The autorhythmic cell is capable of creating its own action potential. And it's going to do it automatically. AP action potential. It actually has its own intrinsic mechanisms for creating an action potential. And that's going to be a whole different lecture. So let's go ahead and, and uh, kind of summarize these autorhythmic cells as one that create their own action potential. There's going to be more to that. Because if you think about each time that this action potential travels through the heart, what's going to happen to that heart as that electricity spreads and conducts to the muscles? Well, that electricity is going to cause the heart to contract. And when that electricity is gone, what's going to happen? That heart is going to relax. A new action potential is created, contraction, that action potential is gone, relaxation. And this is what creates the heartbeat, and this is what creates the heart rate. It's these autorhythmic cells and their determination of the action potential that ends up determining how many times the heart beats in a period of time. And this is called the heart rate. Right? Heart rate, HR. And when we think about the heart rate, we could use units, which is beats per minute. And that's what the heart rate's all about. How many times does the heart actually beat in a minute? Well, that's determined by how many action potentials are created by the autorhythmic cells every minute. <clears throat> Cardiomyocytes. Cardiomyocytes are the myocardial cells. These are the ones that actually contract and relax. So these are the ones that have the sarcomeres, they have troponin, tropomyosin, actin, myosin, cross bridge interactions, just like skeletal muscles did. So these are the ones that are going to, when the action potential from the autorhythmic cell makes it to the myocardial cells, it's going to cause them to contract and relax. It's a pretty unique synergy between those two cells. And as they contract, well, let's think about the, the, uh, the rest of the anatomy of the heart. It's filled with chambers. And the function of the heart is to pump blood. It's those chambers that fill with blood. And each time that that heart contracts, it's going to propel blood out of the heart. This is called ejection, where the blood is going to move from chamber to chamber and out of the heart through those major arteries to the rest of the body. And every time the heart contracts, it's going to eject a certain volume of blood out into the systemic and pulmonary circuits. Okay, This volume of blood is the volume of blood that occurs in a single stroke, in a single contraction of the heart. It's called stroke volume, or SV. So this is the volume of blood ejected in a single cardiac cycle. Each time that the heart beats, it's going to eject a certain volume of blood. What do we call that? That's stroke volume. So what if we look at how many times the heart contracts and relaxes over a minute period of time, but instead of saying just how many times it beats in that period of time, let's ask ourselves, what's the total volume of blood that is ejected over this period of time? And when you do that, I hope you guys just got back to what is the function of the heart? The function of the heart is to pump blood. The function of the heart is to pump blood. 
we're looking at how much blood does the heart pump over time. That's the overall function. Pumping blood is called cardiac output. That's what the function of the heart is. That's all the cardiophysiology you guys are going to learn is all going to be about how do we change cardiac output to meet the demands of the body, to meet the oxygen demands, to meet the nutrient demands, to get rid of pH, right? To try to, I guess I shouldn't say get rid of, but to try to create the homeostasis that is the pH of your blood. All of this is going to revolve around cardiac output. Okay, so if we start putting all of this together, you're going to see that actually cardiac output, which is the volume of blood that's ejected from the heart over time, well, that cardiac output is actually going to be determined by what the heart is doing. Both its heart rate and what else? the stroke volume itself. And this right here is the nuts and bolts of the entire cardiophysiology unit. If you guys can learn this equation, you guys are start, starting off as strong as you possibly can in understanding cardiophysiology. The total volume of blood ejected from the heart over time is equal to how many times does that heart beat in that minute period of time times the volume that's ejected per beat. And I never wrote that up here, so let me do that for you. So when we're looking at the units of stroke volume, we're saying, what is the volume, right? Milliliters or liters. We're gonna go ahead and use milliliters in a single beat of the heart. So what's the volume that's ejected per beat of the heart? Well, that's stroke volume. And this is the summary of how the heart functions. So let's put this into perspective now, okay? Let's say, for instance, we wanted to look at a patient and that patient needs to get more blood out of their heart. Well, what two variables, what two variables control how much blood is pumped from the heart? Well, it's really easy, right? What two variables control cardiac output, heart rate, and stroke volume. So what would happen to the cardiac output in a patient whose heart rate increased? Well, since it's on the right-hand side of the equation, as heart rate increases, cardiac output's equal to that heart rate. So as heart rate increases, cardiac output increases with it. What would happen if a patient had an increase in stroke volume? What if more blood was ejected in a single beat? Well, if we started looking at how many times it is beat over a minute period of time, you'll see that as stroke volume increases, the overall cardiac output is going to increase as well. Alternatively, what would happen if heart rate started to decrease? If the heart started to slow down, hopefully you guys can start to see that that is gonna to start to decrease how much blood can be ejected out of that heart over time. And the same thing goes for stroke volume. As stroke volume starts to decrease, that also starts to decrease the amount of cardiac output over time. But what if we had a scenario where heart rate increases and cardiac output, or sorry, heart rate increases and stroke volume decreases but heart rate increases and stroke volume decreases exactly proportional to how much that heart rate increased. So heart rate increases, stroke volume decreases. Well, if they do it exactly the same amount, just in opposite directions, then cardiac output would have no change. So what would happen to cardiac output if heart rate increased and stroke volume decreased equal to how much heart rate increases Cardiac output doesn't change because they balance each other out. This is a summary of the entire cardiophysiology unit. What you guys are going to learn about next is how. How can we change heart rate? How does the body go about increasing the heart rate 
The answer is going to be the sympathetic nervous system. How does the body decrease heart rate? The answer is the parasympathetic nervous system. How do we increase or decrease stroke volume? That's all going to be related to the sympathetic nervous system and how much blood enters and leaves the heart. And those are all things you guys are going to learn in future lectures. So hopefully this was a helpful summary of the, how cardiac output is going to determine all cardiophysiology that you guys are going to learn. Pretty much all is going to end up coming back to this equation right here. All right, that's the end of this lecture. Um, from Dr. Hudson, hopefully see you at the next video. Be nice to one another and be nice to yourself.